thank you all for coming to this lecture today. My name is Heather Martin and I am faculty in the writing program here at DU and I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about stories. Like you, there's part of my story that begins with first days at the University of Denver. Some years ago, I was a graduate student in my 20s, freshly moved from New York to Denver to study creative writing at DU. I can remember the energy I felt stepping onto our campus. There's a unique kind of liveliness to the fall quarter I found, a newness, a vitality that permeates the air. In part, it's the promise of a new academic year for students, staff, and faculty. It's an impulse toward structure and productivity after the warm days of summer have come to a close. But I think a big part of the energy is the influx of new students, a first-year class, a new group of scholars who bring with them new ways of thinking, new ideas, and new voices. After 15 years, 15 fall quarters, I still feel that same excitement at this time of year. So let me be one of many to welcome you to the University of Denver. We are excited you're here. The title of my talk today is The Anatomy of Story. In my description, I promise to speak for a bit about stories, how they work, what they can do, how they inform who we are, and what makes them lasting. When I first imagined this lecture, I framed it as an anatomy lesson of sorts, a breakdown and a thoughtful exploration. But as I set out to prepare, I began to question this idea of anatomy. Is there, in fact, a science to story? A structure and an order? A formula to follow? The answer, if you ask Professor Google, is yes. Countless lists, diagrams, charts, tables, webinars, videos, classes, even the glorious story sandwich, which I've replicated here, all present digestible ways of understanding stories. To write a good story, they suggest do this. Certainly, there is value to discussing discrete parts of story, and certainly there is value to describing the outer shape and structure of stories to novice writers. But at the university level, we need to go deeper to peel back the skin further. The metaphor of the physical body was insufficient. I wanted to get at something more elusive. What I wanted to do was more than a dissection and a naming of parts. Rather, I wanted to find the soul of story. It is the soul that makes stories powerful, the soul that compels us to keep them with us long after we stop reading and stop listening. As incoming students this week, it's likely that you've told several versions of your own story, where you're from, how you came to be at DU, who you are. This year's common reading, Thomas King's The Truth About Stories, takes up this topic at length. He goes so far as to say, the truth about stories is that that's all we are. Let that sink in for a, mem for a moment. All that we are, he says, are the stories we tell because I find that idea intense and in some ways kind of a bummer, uh, I'll share with you a quick story a first year student told me and his peers during his discoveries orientation some years back. When he was in middle school, the, tu the student told us, he loved peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. In fact, he loved them so much that he ate them every day for lunch. As the years wore on and he started playing varsity sports, he would eat a few peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch, and then another couple after school, and before and after practice and games. By the end of high school, it came to be that he was eating somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches a day. As you would imagine, this did not go unnoticed by his peers. In fact, he became known by all the students in his mid-sized high school as the PB&J guy. And it wasn't a bad thing, he said. Everybody knew him. And in social situations, if ever there was an awkward moment or lag in the conversation, the peanut butter and jelly thing could get him out of a social jam, if needed. <laughs> but when he shared this story with his classmates during discoveries, he was clear on one thing. The peanut butter and jelly story was in the past. As a new student at DU, he was ready to move on and begin writing a new story for himself, a story that had nothing to do with sandwiches. You, too, are in a position to start a new story. Consider, then, what of your stories will you choose to leave behind? 
What of your stories will you choose to carry forward? King says that it's our stories that define us, both the stories we are told and the stories we tell ourselves. He calls upon Nigerian storyteller Ben Okri in this regard. Okri says, we live by stories. We also live in them. One way or another, we are living the stories planted in us early or along the way, or we are also living the stories we planted, knowingly or unknowingly, in ourselves. We live stories that either give our lives meaning or negate it with meaninglessness. If we change the stories we live by, quite possibly we change our lives. Consider then, what stories do you live by? When I was a young mother, a sage friend advised me that my role was as a keeper of memories, that as my children grew up, it was my responsibility to tell their own stories back to them, that the stories I would tell my children about themselves were the first threads in the patchwork that would become their identity. Sometimes our family stories are silly and fun. Sometimes they give us hope and confidence in ourselves. Other times these stories can limit our abilities and fill us with fear. Before arriving at DU, you were asked to write a story. Perhaps this was an enjoyable task to look into yourself to find a story to tell, a story that you could take with you on your new adventure at DU, or to use to introduce yourself to others. Or maybe this was a tedious or even painful task, the act of sorting through the stories of your past. Maybe it was because the stories were scary or embarrassing or traumatic. Or maybe it was painful because your stories felt small or meaningless. As a writing professor and a student of story, I empathize with all of these responses and affirm that they are valid and essentially human. But it's not the bigness or smallness of the plot or the greatness of joy or sadness described that gives a story meaning. The value of a story is in its propensity to tell the truth. And by truth, I don't mean that everything in the story is exactly as it happened in real life, or each claim has been fact-checked and backed up by four sources, rather that it speaks some truth about our shared humanity. You see, the thing about stories, the thing that gives them real power, is an audience. Stories are uniquely human because they can be shared across bodies and minds. They educate us about the experiences of others, but they also make us feel less alone. Okanagan storyteller Jean Jeanette Armstrong notes, when my words form, I am merely retelling the same stories in different patterns. Underneath our individual stories, these different patterns are the same truths. But to tell the truth is to take a risk, to make yourself vulnerable to your audience. Stories are wondrous things, King says, and they are dangerous. To tell the truth is risky, and taking risks in a story requires certain bravery. In his book, King describes learning of the death of his father, a man who abandoned him as a child. At his father's funeral, it is revealed that the man never mentioned King or his brother to his new family. King writes, it was though he had dropped us in a trash can by the side of the road. That's my family, he said. These are their stories. Consider then, what risks do you take in telling your story? When I was 16, I jumped off a bridge, that, that bridge, in upstate New York. And the reason was not, as my mother later wished, because my friends did it. All alone, I hoisted myself onto the guardrail and clung to a girder. Breathless, I wanted to jump. And for the first time, I did. When I was 20, I went parasailing on the so-called Queen of American Lakes, Lake George in the Adirondack Mountains. If you don't know, parasailing is the activity where you're strapped to a parachute that's then dragged behind a boat. When I got up there, I felt the urge to jump, to fall. I even managed to unhook one shoulder harness. The boat driver cut the engine when he saw me dangling by a single carabiner. The crew assumed it was an equipment malfunction. You must have been so terrified, the driver said. I nodded, but I wasn't afraid of falling. I was afraid of myself. When I was 30, I visited the Royal Gorge Bridge in Canyon City here in Colorado, 1,053 feet above the Arkansas River, once the highest suspension bridge in the world. I held my young daughter's hand as we walked across the bridge. 
The wood planks buckled under our feet, and again I was dizzy with the urge to jump. It was in that moment on the bridge that I remembered the Ferris wheel at the fair. I remembered riding the ride with my grandmother as a young girl. At its most vertical point, she pitched our cab forward and announced quite plainly that she hated such rides because when she rode them, she felt the urge to open the gate and jump out. What I had for so long considered my own strangeness, illness, and alienation was now linked to another person. It was a different pattern, but the same truth. If we agree that a purpose of story is to find the truth, we must then, in search of that truth, look to others. This looking to others can be called many things. In the academy, we call it research. When we think of the great Western writers and storytellers, we imagine them sitting at their desks, bellied up to their computers, typewriters, and tablets, buried under stacks of paper, simply being brilliant. We imagine the magic of their minds. But writers, storytellers, like all great thinkers, build upon, rely on, and benefit from the work of others. In King's chapter, You're Not the Indian I Had in Mind, he begins by telling readers how, as a young man, he set about to travel across North America, taking portraits of Native artists. While the photographs would be King's own, the idea for the project was not. Photographers Edward Sheriff Curtis and Thomas Throssell had attempted similar projects. King explores these men's histories and critiques the ways in which they captured Native identity from within and without. King grapples with race and representation in his own life while placing it in the broader historical context of Native identity, both real and constructed. He uses research to interrogate his own position in the story, to ask questions, to tell the truth about his own uncertainties. He writes, so it was unanimous. Everyone knew who Indians were. Everyone knew what we looked like, even Indians. But standing in that parking lot in Oklahoma, looking at the statue of Will Rogers, I realized for perhaps the first time that I didn't know. Or more accurately, I didn't know how I wanted to represent Indians. Juxtaposing his experiences with the stories, research, and artwork of other, others creates a dialogue and introduces readers to a larger conversation. It offers context and adds greater meaning and depth to King's lived experience. Research helps him articulate things he could not if he limited the chapter to his own story alone. Consider then, what histories, ideas, and concepts provide context for your story? How can these other voices contribute meaningfully to the story that you wish to tell? When I remembered the story of my grandmother on the Ferris wheel, my story changed. A new voice, her voice, added meaning to my experience and to the story, and it encouraged me to seek out more voices on the subject. I've since discovered that, like my grandmother, I have a condition sometimes called HPP, high place phenomenon. Unbelievably, it's a real thing. I don't wish to kill myself, no suicidal ideation, as a psychologist might say, but yet I and others like me have the sudden and narrowly controllable urge to jump when in high places. Buildings, bridges. The Grand Canyon. This is not to be confused with acrophobia or a severe fear of heights causing anxiety and panic attacks at, at elevation. To the contrary, I have what they call a head for heights. I just experience urges every now and then to leap. I don't usually do it, you know, jump, but the impulse alone is no picnic as you can imagine. The research I did on HPP further suggests that it is often rooted in childhood experiences involving heights. My family vacationed quite a bit in Niagara Falls when I was a child. It was a half day's drive from home, and the town was a haven of motel pools, penny arcades, and soft serve. It teemed with nervous honeymooners and the knee-socked offspring of blue-collar parents like myself. The amusements in town were fun enough, but my interest was always with the falls. The downrush, the deluge, the ease with which the water curved and rolled over the edge, the noiseless fall of each bead floating to the pools below, and the thunder drone of the water's collective impact hitting the plunge pool with 2,500 tons of force. It never stopped, all day and night the same. <laughs> 
Noticing my growing fixation, my mother warned that if I put so much as a finger in the Niagara River, I would be sucked under and swept over the edge to my certain death. As it turned out, uh, this display of parental concern had unintended consequences. Having never before that moment even considered the prospect of going over the falls, I was instantly wholly seduced by the idea. The notion was absolutely terrifying, but also furtive, lusty. The town of Niagara was and is thick with the lore of the stunters who rode the falls in barrels, kayaks, giant rubber balls, and even one foolhardy attempt on a jet ski. I learned that the first person on record to go over the falls in a barrel was a woman named Annie Taylor. Like me, Annie was born in a sleepy town in upstate New York. Her life was reasonably comfortable by all accounts, but in middle age, she suffered the death of a son in infancy, and, she was, um, and then her husband shortly thereafter. Her biographers report that she was a widowed teacher with aspirations beyond the clamor of the schoolhouse, and that her feat was in the name of fame and fortune. As a young admirer of Annie, this female daredevil, I found this difficult to believe. I gazed across the precipice at the gushing torrent and thought surely Annie was like me, illogically, hypnotically drawn to the silver cataract and its breathtaking vertical spill. There was something voluptuous, something fleshly about the falls, the impossible plunge, and even Annie herself. There's a photograph I found of Annie in the Niagara Museum standing beside her barrel. She wears a long black dress and a large brimmed hat. Her moniker, Heroine of Niagara Falls, is, is emblazoned in white letters across the barrel. She looks hard into the lens, at me, perhaps. When Annie fixed her sights on the falls, she reinforced a wooden barrel with iron bars and lined the interior with a mattress. She had great trouble finding people to help her on her mission, friends not wanting to assist in what was, they presumed, an obvious suicide mission. On October 24, 1901, her birthday, Annie climbed into her reinforced barrel and instructed a friend to propel air into it using a bicycle pump. When the barrel reached 30 PSI, the hole was plugged with a wine cork. Annie went over the falls that day, and she survived. Were Annie seeking fame and fortune, she never got it. She died poor, but her body was laid to rest in the special stunters section of the Oakwood Cemetery in the town of Niagara Falls. When I'm in high places now, I remember this in Annie and her daredeviling. It gives me a kind of comfort. My family and friends do not share this feeling. Once aware of my condition, my loved ones watch me carefully in high places. They flinch and squinch their faces when I belly up to the edge. My mother even went so far as to shriek, don't jump, as I approached a steep overlook at the Colorado National Monument with one of my daughters. The most recent research on HPP suggests that the impulse to jump does not represent a death wish or even a sign of desperation or misery. Rather, it's an affirmation of the desire to live. It's cognitive dissonance, they say, a misread of mental cues. It is, in fact, my urge toward life that causes me to snap back from the edge of a precipice, blood pressure spiking, don't jump. My brain is reminding me not to leap, reminding me of my fragility. This all makes good sense to me most of the time, but some days I do jump. And when I do, I close my eyes and think of Annie. King tells us the truth about stories is that that's all we are. He says, I tell the stories not to play on your sympathies, but to suggest how they can control our lives. For there is part of me that will be chained to these stories for as long as I live. Consider then, how do we make meaning of our stories? If we find the truth and listen to others, our last charge is to make meaning, to think and think and think about our stories. Another word for this process of thinking and thinking and thinking is revision. Certainly, you've heard this term many times, but consider it as a literal re-looking, as a route toward a new vision of the work can change our understanding. Writer Donald Murray calls this the maker's eye. He says, rewriting isn't virtuous. It is simply something most writers find they have to do to discover what they have to say and how to say it. It is a condition of the writer's life 
King emphasizes the fluidity of story as he uses and reuses the story of the earth floating in space on the back of a turtle. He writes, I've heard this story many times, and each time someone tells the story, it changes. We accept this as part of the oral tradition of stories. We accept that they change over time with each teller, and with each telling, they evolve. But when we look at stories on the page, we may tend to view them differently. They appear static and permanent, as if they were written just that way by the genius writer the first time. While the page has an enduring quality, layers of telling and retelling, writing and rewriting lay just beneath it. Murray continues, as writers read and reread, write and rewrite, they move closer and closer to the page until they are doing line by line editing. Each sentence, each line, each clause, each word, each mark of punctuation, each section of white space between the type has to contribute to the clarification of meaning. When I was in graduate school, a trusted mentor told me that each word I wrote from the very first to the very last should lead seamlessly from the beginning of a story to the end. This notion terrified and paralyzed me as a writer. How could I choose the perfect word to lead readers in the exact right direction? I hardly knew what I was writing about or where my story was going. What I didn't understand as a young writer was that he meant that this is to be done in the process of revision. It was only once I had composed the story that the work of meaning making truly began. And this is true of our own stories both those on the page and the ones we tell ourselves about ourselves. They are living things that can and should change and evolve over time. Gerald Visner, who will be visiting campus this quarter, writes, there isn't any center to the world but a story. So as you set about to revisit and remake your stories, recall the language I've offered you today. Tell the truth. Listen to others. Think and think and think about your story. I hope you will use King's stories and my story to think about your own, to question and revisit the stories you've been told and tell yourself, the stories you've committed to the page and the stories you are in the process of telling. And consider the stories you live by, the stories you want to carry forward and leave behind, the risks you take in your stories the histories, ideas, concepts, and voices that will make your story stronger and more meaningful, and the ways in which you present and represent the meaning of your story through careful attention to language. King tells us, one of the tricks to storytelling is never to tell everything at once, to make your audience wait, to keep everyone in suspense. As the Chancellor noted in your welcome yesterday, just as the University of Denver has become part of your story, you have become part of our story, DU's story. And believe me when I say that we are all waiting in suspense to see the mark you will make. Thank you for listening. All right,